a um, Hello, welcome to Walk in the Park. My name is Tony Ingram and this is uh, recorded on December 20th, 2019. You can see all my episodes on public access television. You can see them online, walkinthepark.tv. This is uh, otherwise uh, being shown on public access television, Ithaca, New York, Channel 13, and also in Cortland, New York on Channel 2. And uh, we're going we're gonna to take a little trip to, uh, to Gannick Falls State Park, which... Uh, most of you know, if you're from the area, is up the uh, west side of Cayuga Lake, oh, about 10 miles north of Ithaca, and you can see that green area, that is the park. But we're gonna go there a long time ago. We're gonna go there in 1866 or thereabouts. And this is the Taganic House Hotel. And before that it was called the Cataract House, called the Hal Halsey House, had different names, but it was where the Falls Overlook is today. And this is what the Falls Overlook looked like back at that time, back in the 1860s or 70s or 80s or 90s. And uh, the Taganic House Hotel was built about 1850. And then there was a book that was written about the, um, about the Falls and about the whole experience of being there that was written by Lewis Halsey, who uh, was part of the Halsey family. The Halsey family owned the hotel. And... Uh, so this book was written 1866. Here's a in the frontispiece a drawing, a sketch, which originally there weren't any photographs of the of the falls um, because that was early photography. This is back around the Civil War. There was not much of that. So here's inside Falls of Taganic, highest falls in the state of New York. Well, let's see, containing a complete description of the highest falls in the state of New York. Well, it isn't the highest falls in the state of New York. But that's okay. That's what they thought then. So there's several more. They're actually higher. That's that's another that's another show. But um, anyway, let's let's go. We're gonna dive into it here and go into. Uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna read you. That's what I'm gonna do. Is I'm gonna read you the first chapter, the first part of this book, describing what it was like to be there in the 1860s, the 1850s, and so forth. So um, so that will be reading directly from. The Falls of Taganic by Lewis Halsey. So let's go there. Take a moment to bring that up here. Coming right up. To the true lover of nature, no spot is more attractive, no landscape more beautiful than that adorned by her bountiful hand with waterfalls and wild ravines and stately forests. Unlike other and less favored landscapes, that which adds to its attractions the music and brilliancy of cascades and cataracts is ever unfolding new beauties. But when a waterfall, whose vast height and adds sublimity to its beauty, grand and gloomy gorges and picturesque views of lake scenery unsurpassed outside of Switzerland, each at the same time present their peculiar attractions, the admiring traveler, delighted by the beauty and awed by the sublimity of the landscape, realizes that he has discovered one of the most favored haunts of nature. Such is the wild and varied scenery which turns the attention of the traveler to Taganic, and as the fame of the fall spreads abroad, attracts each year a greater throng of visitors. Rich in romantic glens, charming lakes, and magnificent cataracts, the Empire State may well be called the Switzerland of America. The most lofty and in many respects the most beautiful of her cataracts is Taganic, situated on a small stream in Tompkins County, three-fourths of a mile from Cayuga Lake and ten miles from Ithaca. The stream, known as Halsey Creek from the name of one of the first settlers upon its banks, is one of the largest of the water courses which intersect the fertile farming lands lying between the Twin Lakes, Cayuga, and Seneca. Taking its rise in the highlands midway between them, it flows in an easterly course until at length it unites its waters with those of the calm Cayuga. Flowing with a gradual and gentle descent through a rich and flourishing country, its banks are dotted with numerous mills and manufacturing establishments. 
At the distance of a mile and a half from the lake, it would appear that nature had determined to check the stream in its further progress by erecting an impassable barrier. This is a rocky ledge rising some 50 or 60 feet directly in the path of the little river. But the stream, by long continued labor, beginning perhaps when darkness was yet upon the face of the deep, has succeeded in excavating an enormous channel from 100 to 400 feet in depth and 400 feet across at its lower extremity. Through this yawning chasm, the victorious waters course triumphantly on toward their goal beyond. This vast gorge with its frowning cliffs and towering walls of granite, their grimness relieved here and there by a bouquet of evergreens, forms the ravine of Taganic. Half a mile after entering this gorge, on account of a difference in the structure of the rock, while the height of the banks remain undiminished, the stream falls perpendicularly 215 feet into a rocky basin, thus forming a cataract more than 50 feet higher than Niagara. The rock over which the water plunges projects in the center and is contracted on the other side, forming a triangle which measures some 90 feet across. The following jocular but nearly accurate description of Tiganic was published several years ago in Gleeson's Pictorial, a Boston magazine. It lies about, I like to be particular, one mile from Lake Cayuga's western shore. On either side the rocks rise perpendicular, 390 feet and something more, and all the stream, diffused in drops orbicular, descend in clouds and falling mists that pour 200 feet and 10 or nearly so before they form again the stream below. The following eloquent description of the ravine and falls was written by the celebrated author and orator George B. Cheever, who visited them in 1859. The Staubach of Trumansburg is worth going a great distance to see. It is nearly a third higher than any other cataract in our state. At present, it is the very perfection of beauty while the natural mountain gorge, midway in the progress of which it tumbles over the crags, is one of the grandest and most picturesque in the world out of Switzerland. It reminded me much of the lovely and romantic pass above Chiavenna in the Italian Alps. The gorge is at least 400 feet in depth, the mountain size rise, rising jagged and perpendicular. Though with the green forests here and there clinging to their faces, trees apparently rooted in the rocks without a particle of soil to nourish them, and declivities covered with luxuriant wild shrubbery from the top to the bottom of the gulf. Here and there the mighty crags advance halfway across the ravine, round and perfect as battlemented castles or solid piers that at some distant age might have supported a stupendous natural bridge. At the bottom of the ravine and at the foot of the fall, looking up the great height and watching the extremely graceful and beautiful descent of the spray, for the water begins to break into spray almost at the moment when it begins its plunge over the precipice, you feel that nowhere in the world can it be possible that a more perfectly beautiful waterfall can be in existence. The jagged rock rift through which the river rolls before it makes, it makes the plunge is some 200 feet in depth, the rocky channel becoming a triangle at the brink, and the water plunges some 220 feet more to the bottom, where the ravine is upwards of 400 feet perpendicular. The fall is, in truth, the Staubach of Switzerland, most absolutely reproduced and of concentrated beauty and grandeur. When the stream is swollen almost to utmost capacity of the channel by autumnal rains or a spring freshet, the beauty of the cataract changes into overwhelming sublimity. It is clothed with majesty, grandeur, and thunder of Niagara. At present, you miss the roar, the voice, the sound of many waters, the thunder shaking the earth, because the volume of water is not deep enough to preserve itself consolidated down the dizzy height of a plunge so tremendous. The coquetting air takes the cataract by its curls on the very forehead of the crags, and tosses and frays it into millions of tiny fleecy jets and tangled shining threads of diamonds and dewy light. Each drop gives way to the temptation of a separate display 
and with white wings as of a thousand doves or albatrosses, the vision lights softly at the bottom of the gorge with no more noise than the wind makes when it stirs the leaves of a mighty forest. But when the volume of water is deep enough in its grand and gloomy channel, all this by-play of its forces is constrained and concentrated in a unity of purpose and of plunge, and it rages and roars down in increasing thunder as well as eternal foam. The sublimity then is almost terrific. Lower Ravine To obtain the best view of the falls, it is necessary to descend to the bed of the ravine and follow it upward until we stand at the foot of the majestic column of water which towers 200 feet above us. The wearisome descent of the steep stairway is forgotten in the enjoyment of the grand and beautiful scenery with which we are there surrounded. Leaving the Taganic House, we follow a path winding along the bank of the ravine until we arrive at a long, steep and crooked flight of steps. This was built by the present proprietor of the Taganic House in 1859 and is soon to be replaced by another and more substantial staircase. Clambering downward, remarking as we descend the course of a landslide which swept away a portion of the steps, we at length arrive at the bottom of the ravine. Here we find ourselves entering, apparently, the atmosphere of another climate. The ravine, although from 200 to 400 feet in width, is shut in by walls so lofty that except at midday a large portion of its bed is untouched by the rays of the sun. The air, delightfully cool, fragrant with the perfume of wild roses and vocal with the music of sweetly murmuring waters, seems to instill new life and vigor into our veins. Venerable forest trees overshadow us with their rich and variegated foliage and tower upward in a vain endeavor to catch a glimpse of the rising and setting sun. Creeping vines twine luxuriantly around and above us. Brilliant flowers and handsome mosses are seen on every side. By a winding path we advance toward the great fall, now, for a moment, threading the thick mazes of the overshadowing forest of evergreens, now as we pass an opening to laying to gaze, upon, gaze upward at the Lilliputian specimens of humanity on the bank above, unable to recognize them as our friends who are watching our onward progress now reposing beneath the sheltering branches seated upon the fallen trunk of a forest tree. From time to time we cross on rustic bridges the stream which meanders through the charming ravine as if conscious of its beauties and unwilling to bid them a final farewell. At length a sudden curve in the banks brings us unexpectedly in the full view of the great fall. Here the chasm widens and the more lofty walls form a spacious amphitheater. On either side, the granite masses tower majestically upward and seem to shut us in by an impassable barrier. Before us, from the frowning cliff hundreds of feet in height, the mad waters take their terrible leap. The mighty white column seems clothed with awe, inspiring grandeur. The water, as it approaches the edge of the fall, is of a deep green color. As soon as it leaves the edge, it spangles into a thousand transparent shapes, then mixing and commingling, it is dashed into clouds of snowy foam and descends mists to the depths below. We never became wearied with gazing upon the grand and beautiful picture which looms up so majestically before us. We are continually discovering new attractions. We clamber up the steep bank, bank to view the picture from another standpoint. Now we decide in favor of a perspective view. Now we advance through a storm of misty rain to the very face of the fall. Everywhere we are delighted, everywhere we are impressed by the beauty and the sublimity of the scene before us. We recall Byron's unrivaled description of Bellino. The roar of waters from the headlong height, Taganic cleaves the wave-worn precipice, the fall of waters rapid as the light, the flashing mass foams shaking the abyss, the hell of waters where they howl and hiss and boil in endless torture while the sweat of their great agony wrung out from this their phlegathon curled around the rocks of jet that gird the gulf around in pitiless horror set and mounts in spray the skies and thence again returns in unceasing shower 
which round with its unemptied cloud of gentle rain is an eternal April to the ground, making it all one emerald, how profound the gulf, how the giant element from rock to rock leaps with the delirious bound, crushing the cliffs, which downward worn and rent with his, his fierce footsteps yield in chasms a fearful rent. The Rainbow Here, writes a visitor, we saw distinctly the prismatic colors of the rainbow, mingled with the agitated and gold-green waters. Pool Below the Fall Below the fall, and flowing to the foot of the perpendicular rocks on the right, is a dark pool, perhaps an hundred feet across, and from twenty-five to forty feet in depth. Large masses of rock are frequently dislodged from the lofty banks by the action of the winter frost or summer rain and thunder downward to the ravine below. The Lady of the Mist On the right or north of the fall may be seen, when the water is low, a wonderful specimen of nature's handiwork. It is the apparent representation in the rock of a female, in a half-sitting, half-reclining posture, one hand resting on the rock by her side, while with the other she withdraws her drapery from contact with the mist and spray. Upon her head is an Egyptian headdress, or, as it sometimes appears, a helmet, resembling those seen in ancient pictures of Minerva. This wonderful confirmation in the rocks was first noticed in 1865 by Colonel T. A. Merriman of Auburn. The remarkably distinct outlines of the figure can be easily traced by the visitor standing a fourth of a mile away on the bank in front of the Taganic House. The Gothic Door Towering far upward on the right of the fall is a deep indentation in the rocks, bearing a striking resemblance to a gigantic Gothic door, its lofty arch rising higher than even the fall itself. This singular formation is alluded to in the beautiful poem by Mr. Parker. I love to think that in thy rocky walls, where stands the strangely perfect, perfect Gothic door, the genie have reared their magic halls with crystal column and with pearly floor. On account of the frequent changes produced by the crumbling away of the rocks, the Gothic door has lost much of its symmetry and beauty, but the resemblance is still easily traceable. The following extract is from the correspondence of the New York Observer, Mr. Welch's account. But there is a feature of the lake scenery yet in store for us, surpassing anything that we have seen, alas too often unknown to the tourist, and therefore passed by unnoticed, which would itself repay the traveler for a journey across the state if there were nothing else worth seeing along the entire way. I refer to Ticanic Falls, 10 miles below the head of the lake. The steamboat landing is unpretentious and by no means attractive, but the number that land there is steadily increasing and will continue to hereafter as it becomes better known until the accommodations shall become the best on the lake. A few rods from the shore and quite out of sight from the steamer, the tourist is suddenly confronted by the mouth of a grand gorge, 300 feet deep, perhaps one third as broad, between perpendicular walls of solid rock with a waterfall pouring down its rocky bed. This gorge extends back for a mile, deepening and widening into the heart of the mountain with fantastic curves and overhanging cliffs and a frontlet of pines on either brow. The adventurous pedestrian may thread the entire gorge with perhaps the single risk of wet feet as he passes from island to island on the way. Before he reaches the second or grand fall, he will observe an almost perpendicular ladder of more than 200 steps ascending to the summit of the cliff. If he decline to thread the entire length of the ravine, he may make the circuit of the public road, the side of which borders the brink of the gorge, permitting him to trace its windings as he proceeds and look down into its dizzy depths. Then he can descend from the road by the perpendicular ladder to the bottom of the ravine on his way to the second fall. The gorge swells upward and around him into a magnificent amphitheater, echoing and re-echoing with the noise of the distant rapid and fall. 
suddenly there breaks upon his view a cataract, making a single leap of 250 feet from a pathway 60 feet wide and 100 feet deep, which has it has cut through solid rock. Sometimes when the gorge is filled with water, it is a raging cataract shaking the firm hills with its thunder. Now when the stream is low, it forms one of the most beautiful cascades that any land can boast. It resembles the dust falls of Staubach, which is the pride of Switzerland. Though inferior in height, yet it is superior to it in some other respects. Its waters are nearer, nearer milky white. The height is not so great as to dash it completely dew dust in its fall. It is just water enough to retain some consistency and yet descent enough to make it thin and light and soft as a pendant veil of snowy gauze which, with which the air is fondly sporting and which occasional gusts from below lift into successive graceful snowy folds inwrought with colors of the rainbows which float a while before the eye ere they sink into the seething lakelet that circles below. No words, however, can convey a just idea of the commingled beauty of cascade, precipice, cliff, and gorge. The pencil has made the attempt, but in the sketches I have seen, has, has sadly failed to do it justice. Opposite the fall stands the Deganic House for the accommodation of visitors. From either story of the house, the fall is visible through the leafy trees. The easy swing and rustic seats are each arranged to command a peculiar view. Their perfume of pine fills the air with healthy fragrance and its whispering music floats upon the breeze. Unpretentious but most satisfactory entertainment cheers the visitor and prepares him for an after dinner stroll to the third falls or succession of charming cascades 80 rods beyond which should by no means be neglected for these alone are sufficient to repay one's delay at Teganic. My only regret was that I must bid adieu so soon to the lovely scene. It was, however, with the firm resolve that whenever I might enjoy a sail over Cayuga Lake, I would not pass Teganic by. Okay, so in the words of people from the, around the Civil War, 1850s, 1860s, that sort of thing. So uh, there's a lot more in that book, and I will be um, probably going back to it and reading some other sections to you. Illustrated again, of course, um, The Falls of Teganic by Lewis Halsey, published in 1866. So this is Walk in the Park, walkinthepark.tv to see all my episodes, see it online, see it on TV. Channel 13, Ithaca, New York, Pegasus Public Access TV, Channel 2 in Cortland, New York. There were some references in the um, um, passages that I read that to um, something called the Staubach of Switzerland, Staubach Falls. Well, I had never heard of it, so I looked it up. So here is a picture of Staubach Falls, of the Staubach Fall and, uh, in Switzerland. And it is, oh, about four times as tall as Teganic. So they made a lot of comparisons, but uh, into other places too. But um, the um, one place that you might think, well, why did they go to Europe to make a comparison? When we have some incredible waterfalls in the Western United States, particularly, this is Yosemite Falls in uh, Yosemite National Park in California, in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And uh, whereas the Staubach Falls is about 967 feet high, Teganic, of course, is 215 feet high, the, uh, the Yosemite Falls is the highest falls in the United States, possibly North America. The top waterfall, it actually drops in three sections. In the top waterfall, it drops around 1,430 feet. So that's uh, quite a bit taller than even the, the Staubach Falls. And then there's another waterfall, sort of middle distance, you can only see part of there, uh, just below center. That drops another 600 and some feet, and then the final lower section of the falls drops 300 feet, which is half again almost as much as Teganic itself. So you could put Teganic Falls 
in there and it would only be about two-thirds as high as that lowest section of the waterfall. But um, for our area, it's a, uh, it's a big waterfall. It's the tallest waterfall, and certainly in the Finger Lakes, and um, is a signature place. And so there's a lot of comparisons, actually, with places like uh, um, Yosemite and, and in Switzerland. These are what are called hanging valleys, where water is pouring off a cliff that's been dug out by glaciers and um, forming this waterfall. So that's, that's really actually what we have here. So I'm going to just take a little quick look here at, well, I don't know if I have time for it here, but we're going to go back to uh, this map here, looking at a road that goes up to Gannick. And uh, actually, that's a, uh, an old railroad route. It is the Black Diamond Trail, which was opened not long ago. And I have a real quick video that I'll show you that I made of that. part of what I call my Park Minute series I put out every once in a while. And the Black Diamond Trail is uh, actually the railroad route that used to take visitors up to uh, Tagani Falls from Ithaca and actually all the way up to Geneva and down to Pennsylvania, the Black Diamond Trail. So now it's a, um, a bike hike route that the New York State Parks operates. So they used to go to the, the hotels up there by the Black Diamond Trail. So that's all we have time for. Thanks for joining me. And uh, see you again soon, I hope, for my goodbye uh, video clip here. Coming right up. Um...